Hello, hello. Hi. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the 2024 20, Pop Conference. My name is Michelle Hebel Payan. <laughs> hello. And I am a professor of Chicana Studies in the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. Woo! <laughs> right, home to the traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples. And I am the program chair of this year's POP Conference and the co-producer. <laughs> so, so great to see everybody here, all friends. So this is our 22nd annual year. Can you believe it? It's a 22nd edition. So I have a soft spot for the PopCon. And much of my chairing and co-producing work is a labor of love. So um, I've been presenting at the POP Conference since it was first held at the Experience in Music Project. And then I was able to develop a bilingual exhibit called American Sabor, U.S. Latinos in Popular Music with uh, Marisol Berrios Miranda and Shannon Dudley. And also with Jason Emmons, who is now at the Grammy Museum. And I don't know if he's here tonight, but he'll be here this weekend. Sonnet Retman and I also developed the UW Women Who Rock, Making Scenes, Building Communities Oral History Archive. Yay, woo! <laughs> connect, and it's so connected to the PopCon. So we're so happy to be here today at USC for the first time and the second year in Los Angeles since 2011 when it was held at UCLA. So this year's highly relevant theme is legacies, collections, and archives. And here we are at another crossroads, right, in, <laughs> in our existence. And history has shown us that music has always been there to help us collectively decide the path towards freedom, right? Music is a remedy. Music is medicine. So um, just happy that you're here. So we're, we uh, have a very special lineup. So three days of activities. If you haven't yet, please go to popconference.org. The website is up. You can see the program. You can see what we have in store. Uh, now I'd like to shout out to our partners who came, uh, who are here tonight, and a big, big shout out to our program committee this year, who includes uh, Eddie Alvarez, Jessica Viset Pereira, <laughs> Bettina Judd, Oscar Garza, Amy Linden, uh, Madison Moore, Sonnet Retman, Justin Sales, Audrey Silvestre, RJ Smith, Melissa Weber, Christina Varan, and Deborah Wong. Also, yes, yay! <laughs> Big shout out to co producer Oliver Wang and to, yes, Oliver, yes, and 2025 PopCon chair and producer for next year, Madison Moore. Where are you, Madison? All your questions go to Madison now. Okay. <laughs> well, it was such great work um, in assembling such a stellar lineup of presenters. So happy you're here, and I, I'm speaking too close to the mic, so sorry about that. But also, this is just the list of thank yous, and then <clears throat> we'll move on. Thank you to USC. Thank you to the leadership and staff of the USC Thornton School of Music, the host of this year's POP conference. A special thank you to Jeff DeCane, Evan uh, Calby, Sean, uh, Sean David, Susan Lopez, Heather Pio Roda, Roda uh, Michael Dozier, uh, Stuart Kessler, and Daria Yudakovsky of Vision and Voices, and the many student volunteers. Thank you to our many institutional collaborators, the U USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism, especially Dean Willow Bay, uh, Stacey Ingberg, and Vice Prevet Provost Josh Kuhn, also a PopCon regular. Uh, special thanks to Karen Togson and the USC Consortium, yes, <laughs> for gender, sexuality, race, and public cul culture. And thank you, Dean Amber Miller, and to the staff of the Dornsif. Uh, thank you to the staff at the Tudor Campus Center this, uh, this afternoon, um, the Joyce uh, Camilleri Hall, Greenleaf Kitchen and Newman Auditorium. Special thanks to our media sponsor, Billboard. Again, as I close here, thank to Eric Weisbard, the original curator of the POP Conference, and to Ann Powers, the original, yes, <laughs> producer of POP Conference. Neither could be here tonight due to professional obligations, but they are here in spirit. Also recognizing Jason Emmons for his committed support over the years at MoPOP. Uh, at tomorrow night's uh, second keynote, we will thank all the behind the scenes people who made all of this happen. It takes a village and none of us have slept in quite some time. It is important that we offer this conference for free with no charge to participants. 
in order to give the widest range of people access to these ideas on pop music presented tonight and over the next two days. Inclusivity, right? Special shout out to Rashid Shabazz and the Critical Minded <coughs> Uh, project, the grant-making initiative of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, spearheading the mentorship and development of cultural critics of color. They have been a key and generous sponsor for the past several years, and we would not be here without their help. So thank you very much, Critical Minded. Yes. <laughs> One more thank you on the note of, uh, on the theme of legacies. I understand that the PopCon 24 takes place on the traditional lands of the Tongva people, and, and I acknowledge the past, present, and future stewardship of them and the Chumash, uh, Tataviam, Serrano, Coila, uh, Juan, Juaneno, and Luiseno people of Southern California on whose traditional lands we study and work. For more information, you can see Mapping Indigenous LA. And in the sonic language of Link Ray, Let's rumble, right? Cue the guitar strums. And if you haven't seen uh, the doc, Rumble, the Indians Who Rock the World, please do so right away. Without further ado, it is time for tonight's keynote. I would like to introduce conference co-producer and the keynote producer, Jason King. Jason King is the dean of the USC Thornton School of Music and the former chair and founding faculty member of the Clyde Davis Institute of Recorded Music at New York University. He is a scholar, journalist, author, musician, performer, producer, songwriter, radio and video host, uh, and an event curator. Thank you so much. <laughs> and he has been writing about and curating events on popular music for 25 years, since he was born, basically. <laughs> uh, for, and he's done this for outlets like NPR Music, Pitchfork, Slate, and the LA Times. He's hosted podcasts for Spotify, CNN and NPR Music, and has appeared in several CNN series and appeared in and consulted and produced numerous music documentaries. He is a consulting producer on the forthcoming Pharrell Williams documentary, and he is an inaugural member of the Hip Hop Council at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Right on. He has helped produce the PopCon for the past five years. And so now, Jason, I please invite you to come in and, and uh, get the show started. So thank you. Hello, hello. You brave the rain, you brave the rain. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for that wonderful introduction. Um, for me, Pop Conference is an institution that I have great uh, personal feeling for. I have been attending for now more than two decades, and uh, as a member of the executive committee, I've stepped into this role uh, of co-producer, facilitator of Pop Conference for the past five years. And part of the reason that I've done that is because I really value the idea of being able to extend the pop conference tradition in the way that it brings together this incredible convivial gathering of writers, journalists, cultural critics, scholars, and more together over the period of just a few days every year. I'm so happy to bring pop conference to USC in my inaugural year here as Dean of the Thornton School of Music. Thank you. Um, it coincides with the launch of our new pop music teaching and learning degree, the first of its kind in the country to offer a degree in pop music education. And uh, we are also hosting uh, the Association for the Popular Music Education Conferences here, APME, that's happening June 5th to 9th, and so I encourage you to learn more about that. Um, but very committed um, to the opportunity that we have here to have insightful, informed conversations about popular music. I think it's become increasingly rare in our culture to find examples of what we're going to see tonight. The artist in a conversation, in an illuminated conversation with the writer, with the critic. And so I want to echo Michelle's thanks of Critical Minded. We would not even be here tonight without Critical Minded. They have been such a chief supporter of Pop Conference over the past few years. So thank you, Executive Director Rashid Shabazz. Where's Rashid? Rashid, Rashid, somewhere in here? All right. Can't see him, but let's give him applause, yes. Um, unfailing support to help make all of this possible. Thank you as well to Elizabeth Mendez Berry and the entire uh, board at Critical Minded. Um, so, yes, applause. Um, 
I hope you'll attend the truly wonderful 40 plus uh, panels and roundtables that we have tomorrow and Saturday. As Michelle mentioned, there's a second keynote tomorrow. Wendy and Lisa will be here at Newman right across the street uh, with Timothy Ann Burnside of the Smithsonian. Looking forward to that. Um, so many great panels, just mention a couple. Um, we're gonna keep talking P-Funk with a seat at the mothership, the reclamation of women's stories in Parliament Funkadelic. Tomorrow, featuring Seth Neblett, Lynn Mabry, Cheryl James, moderated by DJ Soul's sister, Melissa Weber. Uh, yay. Uh, Saturday, I'll be in conversation with the legendary Dream Hampton about her soon-to-be-released film that draws from her own personal rich archive and memoir of found footage in hip-hop. Just a small sampling of what's to come. Uh, for the past 22 years, we've only had one moderator of the opening night keynote, the brilliant Ann Powers. Um, yeah. Come on, you're like little applause. Ann Powers, come on. Anne is uh, regretfully unable to be here tonight, as, as Michelle mentioned. Um, but in thinking about this year's theme of legacies and archives and collections, I didn't have to look hard to find another moderator who could bring the fire for tonight's keynote. And I had uh, my sights set on one person, so I made one call, and lucky for me and lucky for us, she said yes. So tonight our moderator is the one and only Danielle Smith. A, a writer and an editor with her own powerful legacy to share. After early stints at San Francisco Weekly and Spin and Billboard, New York Times, Danielle Smith became the first black and first woman editor in chief of Vibe magazine. She stepped into the role as editor at large, editor at large of Time. She's been the editor at Billboard and the culture editor at ESPN. She served on the nominating committee for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She's penned two novels. She's launched the book slash magazine hardcover with her husband, Elliot Wilson. And besides her continuing work as a contributing writer at New York Times, she's the creator and host of the NAACP Image Award nominated Black Girl Songbook, Spotify original podcast centering black women in music. And her award-winning book, Shine Bright, A Very Personal History of Black Women in Pop, is an incredible mix of criticism and memoir. It's new in paperback. The New Yorker calls Danielle Smith one of the nation's most astute chroniclers of pop and hip-hop culture, and we could not agree more. So tonight, Danielle Smith is in conversation with one of the greatest songwriter, performers, producers, arrangers, visual artists, cosmic visionaries in the history of popular music, He's a true legend, master, innovator, who's played such a pivotal role in shaping and structuring the sound of contemporary popular music since the 1960s. As one of the foremost innovators of funk, George Clinton is the mastermind behind the legendary Parliament Funkadelic. <laughs> Along with James Brown and Sly Stone, he lifted funk to an internationally recognized and respected musical genre. In the 70s, P-Funk had over, 70s and beyond, 40 R&B hit singles, including three number one, several platinum albums. Rolling Stone and Spin named Parliament Funkadelic as one of the top bands of all time. And he and 15 other members of Parliament Funkadelic were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997. George Clinton and his bandmates also received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. And with P-Funk and Parliament and Funkadelic, George Clinton has released so many Influential concept albums, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow, Maggot Brain, America Eats Its Young, could keep going on and on. They're also considered to be one of the original jam bands, given that their hours-long performances drew and attracted many of the same fans that populate concerts by the Grateful Dead, Fish and Dave Matthews and so many others. And George Clinton's P-Funk with its infectious groove and irresistible beats became the DNA of hip hop and rap music. He's one of the most sampled artists in music history. P-Funk's beats, loops, and samples have appeared on albums by Tupac, Outkast, Dr. Dre, Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, De La Soul, Fishbone, Ice Cube, Public Enemy, and so many more. George Clinton collaborated with Kendrick Lamar in the influential rapper's Grammy-winning album To Pimp a Butterfly, and we hear the Clinton influence on records by Odd Future, Steve Lacey, Kali Uchis, Anderson Pack, Migos, Flying Lotus, and on and on. Last month, I had the pleasure to see George Clinton perform at a Grammy Black Music Collective event tribute to Lenny Kravitz. He actually shared the stage with Quavo, Watt on guitar, Chad Smith on drums, and more. In his 80s, George Clinton is undaunted, undefeated, and full of more energy and style than most of us can dream of. So I know, I know you will join me right now in tearing the roof off the sucker for Danielle Smith and George Clinton. Let's welcome them.
Let me put my phone on silent. How's yes. everybody doing? Yeah. I mean, is it me or is that is that George Edward Clinton over there? George, yeah. It is. George Edward, yeah. I'm so happy to be here. Um, before we get started with Mr. Clinton, I just want to say how happy I am to be on the campus of the University of Southern California. Um, I'm a California girl, in case everybody doesn't know. I went to high school right down the street at St. Mary's Academy in Inglewood. And I feel like I saw one of my best St. Mary's friends when I walked in. Frantasia? Somewhere. All right, all right, all right. So, Mr. Clinton. Hit me. As Jason does. Are you guys happy to have Jason as your dean? Do you guys know the luck? Y'all went in and stole him from New York, and he's coming out here doing all these wonderful things. I'm so happy that he invited me to be here today and, and to immediately sit me down with the legend. But I'm nosy, so I have, I have questions. I think I'm kind of known for my nosiness. Is it called? Is it called Kannapolis? Kannapolis, North Carolina. Okay. Tar Hill. I don't want to speak out of turn, but the rumor is that you were born in, in an outhouse. outhouse. <laughs> My mother thought she had to go to the bathroom. That cannot be true. It was true. Is it true? How else could I be this funky? <laughs> I know that's not the first time you said this. It's it's legit. <laughs> okay, so how also the way I'm reading it is so you were born in North Carolina, and then your family moved to Washington, D.C. It seems like born in 41, by 44, 45, I was in D.C. Okay. I can remember that. I had to be about five years old. But I can remember planes flying over the city, covering the sky after the bomb had been dropped in Japan. No. So that's like one of my first memories, you know, the sky full of planes and they had something called blackout, where your lights had to be out by a certain time. Yes. Yeah, so I remember that. So about five, five years old, I was in DC, went back to Virginia, Chase City, Virginia, till I was about nine or 10. Okay. And then went to Jersey. And that's where my life started. All right, so you, you're kind of a, just a Jersey boy. Let's go on and say that. Yeah, I'm Jersey boy, yeah. Okay, so my, so my court, anybody from Jersey? Okay, all right, all right. So a question that I have, I'm always interested in like where things just really started. Like what is, when is the moment that you liked the sound of your own voice enough to say, I think I'm a singer? It was a long time before that I got to that point. I knew I couldn't sing when I first started. <laughs> I wasn't fooled by that, you know. I knew that, but I knew how to act, you know. But the thing was, Frankie Lyman came out, a teenager, they called the teenagers, had a record called... Um, Why the Fools Fall in Why Love? Why the Fools Fall in Love. And that, he was about 11, by my age at that time. Yes. So when that happened, everybody thought they could sing. That was a singing group in every school, in every playground, on every corner. It was called doo-wop. Mm -hmm. That's when rock and roll, you know, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, all of that hit the scene, and kids went wild. They, they called us delinquent. That was the beginning of that word. You know, it was Bobby Socks and Blue Jeans. Everybody thought they could sing. You're out here listening to Frankie Lyman, and I think there's a film, isn't there a film where, ooh, Waterfall, yeah, and who all. starred in it again? It was not what I really appreciate is the feedback. <laughs> Lorenz Tate, she said. So I'm trying to picture, so you're in Jersey, you're hearing Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, but you're saying that everybody felt that they could sing, but everybody didn't grow up to be George Clinton though. But I wouldn't become that two years later. I mean, I tried for a long time. We was like that clowning. We 
had, we were actually more like the coasters at first. You know, we did routines of clowning, you know, wigs and stuff. And I then, saw the outfits. You know the outfits, so we did that first. And then Motown came along where everybody was cool, suits alike and Matching. pressed and everything. And I worked in a barber shop, so we made people cool. We did hair, we permed hair, the waves like all the doo-wop singers had in the yes, 50s. Yes, Well, we did that. So we were already stars in the neighborhood because stars came to the barbershop. So the stars were coming to the barbershop in New Jersey. Sam Cooke, Jackie Wilson, the Spaniels, the Flamingos, Moon Glow. Were you making connections? Temptations. Not the Temptations. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Tempta Tempta Fiestas. All those people would come through the barbershop when they came to town. So you're making connections. Oh, I was making connections but right from still, about. Well, wait, Mr. Glenn, but you still don't think you could sing at this point. Oh, no, 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 no. I wasn't, I, you know, it didn't take much singing. You know, it was bow, 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 bow. You know, matter, that was it. You know, kids do that. When, when music gets slick, kids always take it back to the very essence and becomes real simple, just like 20 years later, you know, and they start spitting the beat. Yes. It's a, you know, that, and we was at that era where rock and roll was being born. So it was a lot of unison singing. One person in the group knew how to harmonize. So when did you guys, when did you say to yourself, you know what, me and my boys, we're going to be the parliaments. When we saw the temptations. How could you not, right? They were so cold. They were so cold between them and Gladys Knight and the Pips. Yes. That was like enough to aspire for. We rehearsed night and day and night and day and night and day trying to step. We had the steps, we, it was cool, but our height was off. Some of us were short, some of us were real tall. Mm -hmm. Temps was six feet across, all of them. They were kind of perfect though, weren't oh, they? Oh, they was perfect for They you. were, they, they gave were. you something to reach for. They did, right? Okay, so now here's my thing. So do I need, do I need to play the, this big single from the parliaments or do you guys know that song? I want to testify. Go on and play it. Look at me being the DJ. <laughs> Who could have told you? Okay, so I'm about to pull it up. It was so organized and now it's not. Hold on. I got Anita Baker coming up. I just want to be your girl. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I've been read a lot about you over this last week or so. I've listened to a lot of interviews. I haven't seen a lot of videos. I, ain't seen that. I have not seen you doing that parliament. I'm, the parliament. Oh, no, we don't do that no more. <laughs> like that's I said, his, errors right come and go. And that's a taboo. You don't do those old steps unless you're clowning. Well, okay, but you look. Know, your a, legs won't be a, lie on you. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, though. The theme of the, the, of the weekend and everything is legacy and archives. And the thing is, we need to know that. We need to know that before it was all about, hey man, smell my finger, which I reviewed for Rolling Stone, by the way. I've been down with your whole movement for a long time. So my thing is, we need to know that you was really out here admiring the Temptations and the, and the boy groups, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers. Y'all got your little suits together, matched up. I seen the pictures. But now we're gonna well, now we're gonna surprise you a little bit with this. To the fabulous tech team, we have a code word. And the code word is freedom. Okay. My question is this. My question is this. So you have the matching suits. You, you in here laying people's hair, fried, dyed, and laid to the side, right? You are practicing choreography like you a four top. <laughs> and you still haven't told me yet the moment that you knew that you could sing. I don't know why that has to be a secret. <laughs> but my thing is, when did you say, you know what? F all that. 
I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not matching with my friends anymore. Oh. I want my freedom. Oh, well, that happened gradually. Right there, we was full-fledged under the influence by then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ain't, ain't no sense in lying. By this time, by this time, we had left here. <laughs> by that time right there, we had forgot the temptations. <laughs> we knew that wasn't happening. By the time we got testified, hit record, Motown was at its peak. It was at its peak at that moment. Mm -hmm. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Led Zeppelins, and Cream, yes. Jimi Hendrix, they were taking over. Okay. So we knew we had to make a left turn real quick, you know, and not, you know, not just ease into it. I went completely off. I did it, the band did it one by one, a little bit at a time. They still try to keep the suits together and all that. But I just w went for it because I knew we had to change. It wasn't no taking my time. And they was calling it hippie coming from Europe. Yes, yes. And it, it looked like practicing being poor. <laughs> I knew how to do that. You heard that? I knew that. You knew that? You knew that? Okay. I knew how I could get a diaper or a sheet out of Holiday Inn and make a robe out of it. And that was my costume. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, pause. Like, I know that you did not just sit here and say, I know this in my heart, in my soul, that you did not say that you went into the thrift store, got a sheet, turned it into a diaper. And the thing is, no, the, to the towels with the diaper, because remember they had Holiday Inn written on it. Oh, it was specific. I was specific, you had the sheet. I would just cut a hole in the middle of it and put it over my head. And you, did you know you were a singer yet when you were doing that? No, I didn't, no, I knew, how to, I knew how to act, I knew how to record, I knew how to make records real good. But I didn't get to that part you're talking about, to around Mothership Connection. When what? I, by this time I knew how to manipulate voices, I knew how to get the best out of other people singing. Eventually I learned Myself, how to do it. I could tell people how to do it long before I could do it myself. That is, that is wild. I, I was a producer. I just that just mean get it done, but you know, and I knew who would do what good, and I made sure I got everything out of the people that could do it. And I had some good musicians. They was all kids from the same neighborhood. Self-taught producer. Yeah, most of them, except for Bernie Worrell. Bernie Worrell was a keyboard player who went to Juilliard with Berkeley. Oh no, he was, he went to school. Eddie Hazel was like a blues genius. You know what I'm saying? So he, I had the elements of music, the rhythm and groove of the, the rhythm section. And Bernie had the classical, which enabled us to color it any way we wanted to, from Motown to Louis Jordan to the Beatles to classical music, and all of that was going on. When rock and roll started, it went like Emerson Lake and Palmer, uh, Jethro Tull, Jimi Hendrix. All those people played real good jazz music, but it was still all rock and roll. It was. And so we learned when we did Free Your Mind, Your Ass Will Follow, we learned we didn't want to be in a bag, that we had to come out with a hit single every time. We would do albums which allowed me to do it conceptually. I could do songs that I knew wasn't going on the radio, but songs like that last forever. Albums as opposed to 45s. Call on me real quick. But how did you hear this in your head? Oh, no, I had the best teachers in the world. Motown had every kind of producer, writer you could think of. If you paid attention to that company, the, the, it, it had everything covered, all the bases was covered. So I just paid attention to every writer, producer at Motown, starting with Smokey Robinson. You know, that was my idol, you know, all the way through this, <laughs> even to this day. But, but how did we get, see, this is the, I'm trying to get the, the leap. I'm trying to get... Like, we're temptations, we're matching, we're paying attention to Motown, we're doing choreography, we're paying attention, rock and roll is happening, 
you're being influenced by all that, but at a certain point, you just really twisted that all up and it became a whole different thing. I'm trying to get to what, what, what happened? Well, first of all, I was a songwriter. And if you're a songwriter, you appreciate all the music. Every style, you just, you got to write a song for whatever style they needed. When you're a songwriter, you had to concentrate not on one genre. Anybody that needs a song, you had to be able to produce it for that person. So you weren't married to any style. Styles came in, just like the barbershop I worked in. Styles came and go. So doing that, paying attention to all those styles, I was able, when it was time for me to do it, to act like I had some sense in actually playing it, Mothership Connection, I could pull all those styles together and do what you're talking about. I could make records that, that sound like excellent, produced, clean, maggot brain and all those, we did in two days. We just got tripped out and turned, turned the instruments on and jam. So we knew how to jam, make jam records, blues records, really free. And then we also knew what Bernie had went to school for. We knew how to arrange them classically, sonically correct, as Prince would call it. We know how to do all of those things, and I picked and chose when I wanted to do them. Some I intentionally did 15 minutes of, you, you need a, a certain headspace to even hear it. I thought, I'm not going to be able to fill 45 minutes. What was wrong with me? Because we're already getting into the time. I want to ask you about 70 50, 11 more questions. I want to play 85 more songs. I, I want to talk to about my own personal relationship to somebody that was so influenced by you, but wow. when that came out. That's a weird one right there. For real, we, was, we were like a, in that zone at that time. We, were, we knew things was happening. We were at Hollywood Sound over on Selma right here in Hollywood. And we were finishing up the session. We had one more track. We was getting ready to, to overdub the lead guitar on. The kid that's playing guitar on that, I never got a chance to get his name. He was walking by the studio. Sweat, sweat, true story. True story. He was walking by 17, 18 years old, little white kid. He said, give me, 20, give me $25 and do a solo. In, the, in, in, in school. I said, anybody with that much nerve, give me $25 and I'll do you a solo? I want to hear what you're talking about. <laughs> he had to go back outside and get his guitar. He didn't have a case. He just had to get to his head. Came in, and when we saw the guitar, we could see it had all kind of extra humbuckies, and it was a real good guitar. He didn't look like he should have that guitar. <laughs> He plugged it in, and from that moment, that sound you heard come on? Yes. He hit that note. He played from top to bottom without stopping, and nobody could say a word. I gave him $50, and I was going to give him more of them, but he was gone so fast. In the wind. We never found out who he was. If somebody doesn't do a documentary and find that man, I don't know what we school I'm did, at. We done did that a thousand times. And you don't hear that in Prince right there? You don't hear all of that in everything that Prince was making? That energy, those, cur those curse words, that rebellious spirit, all of those things? You just hear it, you just hear it, you just hear it. I still want to know when you found out that you could sing. What was the song? Shit, goddamn. That's not the song. Oh, the one that I knew I could sing? Oh, hey, I just got back from another world. And there's a guy right on Hollywood Boulevard singing with a folk guitar player. He was about 65 or 70 years old at that time. I told him to teach me that song. And I actually recorded that song with, you know, with this guy. And when I could actually follow a song like that, I really kind of felt like I knew what I was doing. And so you started hearing a lot of me singing more without the character. I did characters all the time. But as far as trying to lead, I did, One Nation, I, that was momentum. 
I was feeling so good then, I was on top of the world. I just ad-libbed what they call freestyle. I just ad-libbed that right off the top, you know, and Joni had just got with us from the Ohio Players. So we felt like we could do anything. Funkadelic usually was very strange. We didn't try to make straight records with Funkadelic. That one, we couldn't help it. It was so straight and prop, clean. Think about it. The only other one was, was Knee Deep, which came right behind that. It was, it was a moment, but I want to say, I think that sometimes as artists, I, I can't imagine making that kind of music, that kind of genius music. Um, but we, hear, we as the fans, as the listeners, I think, hear it differently. At least for me, when I heard One Nation Under a Groove, I did not think that that was a smooth pop song. I thought that was raw and rowdy. I thought it was something that my mother was like, if you don't turn that crazy music down a minute. Well, I'm just comparing it to other funkadelic records. That's the only reason I'm saying. Oh, no, it was definitely raw and funky. Yes. But we usually had guitars all over top of funkadelic. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't, you know, it was more of a, a band, you know, musicians. That's the other thing about the group. We always wanted each member to be known personally. You know, we found that from the rock bands. You knew the drummer, you knew the guitar player, you knew the bass player. It wasn't a backup band. So consequently, we did it on record. Like Motown, most of the musicians were, you didn't know who was playing. You didn't. And that's one of the best bands in the world. Yes, hope James James on that. Funk yes. Brothers. You found out about the Funk Brothers 30 years later. That's but good. we knew who they were. Of course y'all did. Which brings me to a question. Um, as somebody who don't ask me to do it right now, even though I could and it would sound bad, um, because I went to public school in the era that I went to public school here in the state of California, I had an opportunity to learn how to play instruments. So I could play the flute, shout out to Lizzo. And, but that doesn't, um, it, it has helped me as a music writer too, to know how to read music and everything also. Um, in case anybody out here thinks, well, my question for you is, where, where are the bands at? Where are the bands? I get that there's not bands because maybe there isn't, uh, you don't get to be able to learn to play musical instruments for free in public schools anymore. Um, maybe people don't want to collaborate. I don't even know what it must be like to be a leader of a movement of 50, 60 people like Parliament Funkadelic? Right there in your lap, that's, that's what it is. Most people make their music on the laptops, so musicians don't usually have a chance to get together and kick it and trade ideas. I mean... I, that, I don't like that. Well, I mean, progress do that to you. You get rid of a lot of things you really like for whatever's news coming up. We had to give up a lot of that, but that's one of the things that we didn't miss. We the band still play. We play three, four hours, and supposed to be twenty people on stage. Musicians that played with us twenty years ago. Whenever city we go in, they'll show up and they're up there because there ain't many places you can play. And we learn how to do it for today's kids because they're used to that sound. Yeah, yeah. That sonic sound of a track playing behind. The, so we use the track and the band at the same time. So we do all of it. That's right? why it sounds so rich, though. That's why it sounds so layered. And and it actually served both purposes. People that wants to hear the old school, they're satisfied to see you playing and, and hearing solos. And the the sound of the 808 and the, 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 of the sound of the day, the kids that love this music is satisfied. Wow, they're doing something right. All right. I believe in the pendulum swinging back, so I'm just gonna keep my fingers crossed that the people in this room are gonna be bringing that movement back. I need some instruments, y'all, I do, I do. And I, you know, you could do it here too, you could do both, just like Mr. Clinton just said. So here's a, a story that I was, I'd always heard, but I think I did not really believe it. It's one of my favorite songs. Really, it's my favorite Zap song. Oh, let me, let me. That, that song, that song was the beginning of what they call it now sampling. It wasn't, they didn't have sample machines yet. We literally had to cut the tape. And that bass line is only five seconds long. We cut 
That bass line out of another song called Funky Bounce, which was on that was our first album. I didn't hear a hit single in the record at first, but that beat, that bass line was so infectious, we cut the tape, just that line, but 10 or 15 times, stuck them together so we had you know, six bars, eight bars of that bass line. Definition of innovation. And looped it around the two track in a pencil. Just why it's called you looping. Know, around the head of the two track and just let it run for 10 minutes. Roger wasn't even there when we did it. because You know, he had given me the album and was ready to put it out. We got that groove. I called him in and told him to play his West Montgomery licks that he liked to play. And that was the, that whole song, More Bounce, and we just did More Bounce. And he did the harmony with the talk box on the Moog and the guitar. Most of the time, you only heard the talk box on one track, not harmony. Peter Frampton had done it so good, Sly told Roger, after Peter Frampton, you're supposed to bury the talk box. <laughs> but doing it with harmony sounded like a new instrument. And some people thought, oh, they did a Mellotron. It was a $110 talk box. Is there anybody in this room that's in my age group that remembers hearing more bounce on the car speakers? Do you remember how that just trembled your whole body when you heard it? And you know, most people didn't know that was us. No, most people didn't know that. No, we didn't say too much. Roger, we took Roger out on his first. He wanted to be Roger in the human body, but he needed money, so we got him a deal at Zap, which was his little brother. We just made up a name for a band and gave it to Warner Brothers, and luckily that more bounce was such a hit. He hated to go out as Zap. He wanted to wait and go out as Roger, but the record was so big, they were forced to be Zap. Oh. How did you feel, because what I want to get into, I'm just going to announce what the back end of the question is. We're talking about legacy today, obviously, I'm trying to anyway. I don't think enough people know your legacy of fighting for copyright for artists. So, but there's also this, I wonder if what it must feel like, all that great story you told about you and Roger and creating this amazing hit, More Bounce. Do you remember the first time you heard somebody sample your song and how that made you feel? Do you remember? On the B side of Sugar Hill's first record. Do you love a person that just really has a story? <laughs> what the, what's her name? It's the girl group. Sequence. Sequence, there you go. Se Who is this in the pink? And, and Sequence, the lead singer was? Angie B. Really a music Angie, school. Angie Stone, who's with... We know who Angie Stone Angie, is. Angie Stone is. Okay, they did the first record sample that I, that I know of. I know a lot of people that was do, making records in the Bronx, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I know everybody had, you know, the Bimbada and um, all of them, of Daddy Kane and all of them. Yes, I yes. knew everybody that was making records, but not making songs, but not putting records, they was calling them the mixtapes. Yes. But they put they that record really out, and it's being to put that record out, and that was the beginning of hip hop. Yes. But it was the B-side of the record. You got a real type of thing going, going down. down, getting down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, and after the first one that came to us and, and paid us and said we want to do it was De La Soul and Digital Underground. Okay, we don't even talk about digital right now because really those are my people and we're gonna get to that. I just but did a new record. Don't, 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 is on that k tail package. <laughs> where, they, where they selling it and they don't even want to talk to you. It's true. This way, I knew, well, if they making it 
that available and accessible, I'm, all I got to do is figure out how to get in there. Mm -hmm. You know, so I made friends with people. I made records called Sample Some of Disc and Some of That, yep. which made it easy for you to sample. I moved the voices out your way, moved the horns out your way. I knew that that was a way for us to get back in with the new generation. Because once you're three or four years older than the new audience, yes. you're supposed to get your ass out of there anyway. You're supposed to go to the retirement home, and that is not what happened to George Clinton and Paul. No, no, I, I like whatever kids doing, especially if it get on my nerve. Okay, so let me just... Because it's the new thing. You a handful. Somebody know that you a handful, too. I don't know I who... do. Okay, you do, okay. <laughs> when did you know you had to start paying attention to legacy? that you had to start telling your story and, and, and saving stuff and, and, and talking about your process and sharing with people like, like you're doing here right now, letting people know who you are and what you did because it's gotta be a moment where, cause you up here shaking your booty in the diaper, right? But there is a serious, side to just being a, a genius and an innovator. I tell you, when I got about 75 years old. Not 75. 75. I mean, I thought I, I could do this shit forever. I could do this longer than money long. I could do this for days and hours. I thought I could do it. And I don't get sick often, very something in my life. I got sick around about 75. And then I realized, hey, you ain't got all that kind of time to be out here recreating new stuff, you know, radio don't just play stuff no more. It's something called the internet now. You start realizing you don't know how to survive in the new media. That scared me more than learning how to make a record. I could always conform to whatever the, the groove is on the street or what people want to hear, but getting it played became the reality. Yeah. Then I realized you can have a good record and nobody ain't got to hear it. Yeah. Plus you, oh, you're not of that generation. You need to have some way to tell your own story, to do your own narrative, to you know, talk yourself. Because that's what we did. We were always friends with all the DJs. We was at every station on the air like I am now, clowning with the DJs. We was really down, we, they promoted our shows. We knew how to do that whole politicking thing. We had that down. When the internet came, we didn't realize that that was going to take, take over the radio. CDs wasn't even happening no more. True. So all of the things you used before to get your music out there was gone. We had to figure out a new way, you know, to get it on there. Now I'm, I'm on TikTok with my grandkids. You know, I know how to get, I, I know how to get the clown and get followers or get all that. You know, I know that game. So what? What do your um? What do What do your grandkids think of you? What do your grandchildren think of you? My grand, my granddad, you you cool old dude. <laughs> <laughs> they call me grand dude. Grand dude, you know, you, you know, you ain't like most grandparents. You know, which to make them think that they can confide in you. I'll be like, I don't need to know that. I don't, I don't need to know, keep, you know, if you ain't going to tell your mama, don't tell me. <laughs> you know, they, I, I'm just, you know, I don't know what to say no other way, so I don't get involved in that one. I know my limits that way, so I like, <laughs> I just listen. Do you feel like there's still things, or well, by that, let's just go, you... You jumped ahead of me a little bit and you said that you just recently started working on um, some music with uh, Digital Underground, which is my, one of my all time favorite bands. I know the guys and I miss Shock and I used to go out with the road manager cause that's what we do when we young. Um, and we're still friends, me and Elle. Y'all don't want that whole story, but I'll give it to you after the show. Um, <laughs> no, but in, in honesty though, it, it, it's wonderful. They, digital rolls like they rolled like a band. What? They rolled like a band. They were a band. They band. They were a band prior to to rapping. 
As a matter of fact, they used to actually sing some of their rap songs. Yes. As a group, all of them. And Shock was a good keyboard player. Yes. So they had a couple other money. B. They all could play instruments. They could. And Dave, sing. Jimmy, all yeah. of them. Yeah. And Shock's yeah. brother. Yeah. They they were a band first, and they yes. just happened in on the time when hip hop was coming in, and they was able to f flip it. And they was, they was actually P Funk All Stars. They was on a lot of our stuff. Yes. We was on. We did a whole album with the Sons of the P. Yes. I literally. They came to Detroit and we did that. Tupac was still dancing. He was. Um, it always sounds weird when you be like, "I'm with the band," but I was definitely with the band, and um, and I wish somebody would check me on it. Um, It's like, I remember being Neil Johnson, the, the sleuth, the road manager, who's also on a cover of the Sex Packets album, and, and, and Shock G were Greg Jacobs, may he rest in peace, were roommates. And I remember seeing Shock um, drawing. Oh, the book? The, 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 the booty holes? All that. Ridiculous mess. But I was like, what are we doing, Gregory? What are we doing? I, and, I got the first copy of that book. And he said, this is, George Clinton inspired me to this. So I have it out of his mouth. He said, George Clinton inspires me every day of my life. I would not be uh, making music on this earth. I would not have the courage. We all do know that Shock G and the Humpty Dance are the, and the Humpty Hump are the same person. Okay, so I'm not giving up no secrets. So, um... But to, to be that weird, to be that, to say I'm going to have two personalities as a rapper with two different voices and have my cousin, my, his brother Ken, play Shock G when he, when he had to be Humpty on the stage, it's all very P-Funk. It's all very, and I just didn't know if you, I mean, I guess I knew that you knew, but do you know how those guys loved you? His mother told me. He had, uh, we had an album called Clones of Dr. Funkenstein, and we had a statue, I mean, a cardboard statue, you know, about five feet tall, and she said he used to carry it on the subway when he was in New York. She got it from one of the record stores, and he was hitting people with it, but <laughs> trying to carry it. She, I mean, she told me all of that, but then when I met him, we was really tight. We worked a lot together. He was into the funk the same way I was into Yes. I mean, he was Bootsy in another life. Aw, oh, Bootsy. Rubber band. Okay, so going back to legacy, and I think we're getting up to the point. You guys need to get your questions together because we are having a little question and answer, period. Um, how are we doing out there, Super Tech team? Okay. Again, to legacy and archives. I have such an issue with, like, where's our stuff? You know, like where is the stuff I wrote for the San Francisco Bay Guardian? Where is it? I had to go, to write my own book, I had to go to the San Francisco Public Library and pull it up on the microfiche. That's really the age that I'm at. And I don't, and it, but it, it, it's that, but it's also just like where, where is everybody's records? Where is everybody's cutting room floor stuff? Where is the outtakes? Where's everything? But even more than that, what scares me sometimes is where is the evidence of the joy, right? That, that George Clinton brought to this world. And because of the connection of Greg, before we get to questions and answers, I just wanna say it is a concern, this evidence of joy. We, we have to have stuff like this someplace or else people are going to start acting like music didn't do what it did. Well, like I said before, we just put out a, a song that Shock did with us years ago, and we just released it um, on one of these new platforms where you, your fans can get gifts from you or mm -hmm. music or paintings or whatever. Right, like Patreon or something like that? Patreon. Uh -huh. We just did this past week on the first, every month, we're going to have, like you said, cutting room floor mu music. Yes. Stuff that didn't make it on the records. Yes. Songs was too long, or songs was unfinished. Um, songs that I just like personally that never got on the record. 
we got a ton of that. We put out two, no, we put out five albums called Family Series, mm. which had a lot of those records on them that never was released by groups that we never got a chance to release. Jessica Cleves and stuff like that. But Patreon, every month, you're going to see new funk. And it's from the sessions of Flashlight, Knee Deep, Taylor Roof. what we need. Same sessions. Yes, this is, this is, that's good news, Mr. It's on its way. That's good news. Who has a question? Put my glasses on. Who got an A? Do they still give A's out at USC? What's going on? What's your name? Yo, 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 first of all, um, I, I really don't have a question, just a comment. Mr. Clinton, Can I have George your name, Clinton, though, real quick? Name, sir. Baba, name, sir. I just want to say to you, from all of us on the West Coast, West Coast hip-hop artists, DJ Clientel, <laughs> Compton, California, represented man, we, we love you. We thank you so much for the, being an inspiration uh, to our music and to really helping us on the West Coast put a footprint on this hip-hop thing, man. So thank you. Absolutely. So much, Can you just introduce yourself to the room, sir? Who's it? Who is it? No, it is not. I need to get these glasses together. All respect, sir. Thank you for, for that. Who's next? I see you. Who's next? Oh, let's go over here. Good evening. Hello, Danielle. Shout out to the San Francisco Bay Guardian. I'd Look. love to give a shout out. Um, I'm Oliver. Uh, Mr. Clinton, you know, growing up, I know that your band started in Jersey. You have a deep connection to Detroit. But as someone who grew up on the West Coast, when I didn't know any better, I always assumed that Parliament Fucking Delic were a West Coast band because so much of your music defined the sound out here. And what I want to know, at what point did you realize that the West Coast sound was like so heavily P-Funk? At what moment in your career did you make that connection for yourself? Well, when we did Flashlight, when we did Flashlight, Steve Barnes was on KJLH, and one, one of those stations out here. They used to play it so much, and we were on K-Day and all of them so much out here that that sound that from Flashlight, Knee Deep, One Nation, the one more bounce, all that became that G-Funk G sound. That's why so much of was sampled. So we just chose LA as our second home because we had the East Coast with the Funkadelic, Maggot Brains, and We Want the Funk and all of that. That pretty much everywhere we go, we usually end up staying there a while and we got out here and we couldn't leave. I had to crawl out of here. I'll take, I'll take next. My name's Nerea, and I also don't have a question, which is kind of the cardinal sin, but I, in the spirit of legacy, I got the distinct honor to write about you and Overton Lloyd and about your fine arts practice for Rolling Stone, which you guys didn't even get to get to because you've done too much in your life, uh, but all of your fine arts and your painting and all of that, and I just want to say thank you, and I know a lot of people in this room and in the spirit of PopCon and as music journalists, to be part of people's legacies as they're building it is something that a lot of us don't take for granted, so thank you for your time and for letting me be part of that part of your legacy as well. Ah, uh, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wait, did you say your name? Well, I'm really gonna be about it. What, did you say your name again? Rhea? Thank you, Rhea. Thank you. Hello? What up, girlfriend? Right on. Melissa of New Orleans. All right, Melissa. And I was wondering if you could speak to your legacy of revolutionizing and elevating live music production, concert production for black people in the 1970s. Talk about it. From the Chitlin Circuit to stadiums that white rock acts were doing that you made possible. I, let me tell you something. I really should have had that question. That's a good question. But, but that, was, that was my ambition to be able to do what a group called Pink Floyd. Ooh, not Pink Floyd. He, before even, before any of the other white bands or rock bands was doing, Pink Floyd always had that big production. That's what made me want to get the mothership. 
and be able to play those big coliseums and everything. And we did it once we got to Mothership, and we became what most of the groups, only Sly Stone over here was able to do that in that Woodstock show. But n nobody else was able to do it until we were able to get ourselves, Bootsy, Fred Wesley, Maceo Parker from the JB. Once we got the big production of the mothership in that tour, that was my ambition to be what, you know, Pink Floyd and the other one was Cream. They was all, not Cream, but um, uh, Queen. Queen. Queen, who was able to play those we will rock you stadium. Yes. Ain't many people that can do that one. That, there's so many of us in the band that we need a place like that to play. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mr. Clinton. Thank you, Melissa. And this is? Hi, my name is Brenda. I am so happy to be here. Um, my friends and I, when I was DJing this past Saturday, we're singing Knee Deep and trying to remember the name of it. We're like, what's that Funkadelic song? And we're singing it to each other back and forth. We're humming it into our phones and then finally we got it and I mixed it in. So my question is you, to you is for this new generation that's stuck to our laptops, how do we become musicians again? Oh, For the new generation that's stuck to our laptops, how do we become musicians again? Jam with your friends. Yes. Get together and just kick it and jam. Make noise as opposed to earphones and laptop by yourself. Get two or three people and make some music. Just jam and get that spirit. I mean, until they start putting music back in the schools where everybody can do it, we're going to have to do it ourselves. That's Thank okay. you. And can I add something to that? Also advocate for education in the schools, for music education in the schools, mm -hmm. whenever you possibly can. Our voices, they, they matter more than we think they do. And whenever there's an opportunity to vote, or even just right now, asking, putting it in the universe, it's an amazing thing. I'm, that's such a great question. Thank you. What's happening over here? Uh, hi, I'm Chi Chi. Um, I kind of want to piggyback off that into your earlier question as to like, where are the bands? Yes. Um, I throw in the wrinkle, where is the money? Ooh. Cause like. You better I, say it. I, I can only imagine, you know, pick an album, Chocolate City, what was the budget for something like that? And that like, how do we convince someone to give a band of 10, 20 musicians that kind yeah. of budget in 2024? Yeah, that's uh, I'm, I'm a I, I just, in my group, we just donated instruments, you know, to uh, the school that I, I started the group in Jersey, 1956. We just went back there to grade school and bought them guitars and the amps and keyboards mm -hmm. to do our part and just trying to help. Because I remember when I was going there, kids used to bring their instruments to school. Yep, I did. And by the 70s, I think they had started taking them out. Mm -hmm. It was. So... KP, um, and I'm hearing what you're saying. You're talking about like labels giving advances for those kinds of things. I just interviewed. And then going out on the road, like. Yeah, no, it's it's like a it's a lottery at this point. Yeah. Is anybody familiar? Well, let me, Blast, the artist Blast. We were. I was interviewing him for something, and he was talking about how you know because he's finally doing an album and how he finally has a budget to actually pay people to play instruments and I was listening to him and he's so excited and into it and I'm like it shouldn't be so rare mm -hmm. so I and wish if, I wish I had better news that's good and if the record companies do it give you the budget they go on it that's the other side of that so you have to try to like get together and get, put your money in a pot put your money in a pile <laughs> put your money in a pot thank you KP my name's Hanok. Hanok. What is it? Hanok. Kenna. Hanok. Hanna. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you guys talked about it for a second, but I wanted to ask about Junie, Junie Morrison, his like his influence. Bad brother. Yeah, I want to hear if if you could tell us anything about Junie, like a cool story or something. Wow. <laughs> you put me up on Gangstar. Okay, no, I want to know. I tell you a good one. Knee deep. I used to sing that song. Just to myself, fishing, you know, she did free, 
never missing a beat. Not just needy, she was a lady. Just singing to myself all the time. And he heard it over a couple of years. Why don't you record that, man? <laughs> I say, you know I, you know, I didn't want to do it because I say it's got a, a three, a three, four time spot, and you know, round and round the floor, she's dancing. I love. I was thinking in terms of waltz, and I didn't think that was cool. To, you know, put a record. Nobody could dance to that. He's in. He said, "It can be arranged, man." <laughs> you know, he talked. And when um, I sang it to him, a cappella, and he went home and did the old school thing of writing a chart writing the music to fit what I was singing. People didn't do that no more. They, you know, they jam and figure out what you're singing and make the track accordingly. He actually went to old school, wrote the chords out, then wrote the parts out and played them all himself. And he brought the track back to me and said, sing it the same way you always sing it, man. And I sang it and it fit every part. And I was like, Okay, I see. And that was a journey. He, but he was so precise, his harmonies, and no higher players. I knew him from, you know, the early days, Funky Worm and all of that. Besides Bernie, when, and when you put those two together, One Nation Under Groove, once we bought these brand new keyboards, we opened the box, and One Nation Under Groove was the first thing Junie and Bernie played on together. Tremendous brother. Can I ask a follow-up? Come on, Hannah. What's going on? So how did you get all these established musicians to join your band? I don't know. Probably, like, you know, I always thought like Sun Ra. <laughs> a lot of musicians that, <laughs> musicians that weren't able to do what they wanted to do or felt they wanted to do. It was Play, this is a place you can come in and do everything they tell you not to do in the studio. I was known for that, so a lot of them just gravitate to, oh, yeah, I can go in and do my thing. And I kind of like that. And uh, it was a nice marriage. between. And I end up some tremendous musician. I mean, musicians that's not even in the band consider themselves in the band. <laughs> it's a people band. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, you guys, we're running out of time, so we're going to have to keep these questions quick and to the point. Hi, uh, my name is Mickey. Hi, Mickey. Hi, uh, thank you for your conversation. Um, I wanted to sort of piggyback on the conversation about uh, how you interacted with hip-hop and ask about the To Pimp a Butterfly sessions and Wesley's theory specifically. Um, your interaction with hip-hop obviously has been a lot through samples, as you talked about and asked about. Um, I wanted to ask what it meant to be sort of welcomed into that environment through hip hop and funk and jazz and to be a part of that sort of collective of musicians um, in your wheelhouse through hip hop. Well, I put it like this. To Pimp a Butterfly, when, when Kendrick came to Tallahassee, Florida, and, and my, grand, my grandkids told me, Granddad, you really want to work with him? He, he, he sounded like you. I didn't know what that meant. But when I did talk to him, he sounded of my age. He was so familiar with everything that, you know, we was done. he was interested in music Legacy. all around. And I heard the instruments of people that was playing with him. That was easy. And, and coming from Compton, the, that whole generation is still going on. Like the girl said over here, Lauren Horsley, young lady artist, you know, all of that is bringing this whole connection of P Funk and Compton together. So I mean, I look at things like that. The whole culture, when I look, you know, look at the different artists, different style, and how they try to intellectualize the art. All of it's to me. I'm learning and going with the flow. Yeah. Thank you. What's happening over here? Hello, my name is Bettina Judd. Bettina. Um, so thank you so much for everything in your legacy, but particularly for me, Maggot Brain. Maggot Brain is a whole album, 
but Maggot Brain as a, the, the title song, um, I write about it in my book. Um, hey. And I want to ask What's you, the book title, though? What's the book title? The title of my book, book is Feeling Creative Practice Fem in Black Feminist Thought. And I talk yes, about... Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I talk about Maggot Brain and, and the way that you talk about bringing whatever it was out of Eddie Hazel as an example of how black creativity, black study is also a study of grief, right? Um, and there was something specifically you said, and I'm gonna quote you right here, you Go said, ahead. I knew it was good beyond good, not only a virtuoso display of musicianship, but also an unprecedented moment of emotion in pop music, right? And so we talk about how we like to party, to Funkadelic and everything, but that was something else. Could you talk a little bit about how you pull out emotion in your music <laughs> and out you of other musicians? You guys have good That's questions. Good. This is a school. Eddie Hazel was an emotional, and he was an emotional dude. I mean, he was sensitive as all hell. And his grandma had taught him blues. She could play blues with three strings, any three strings. He was so bluesy and had so much feeling in his playing. And I saw what Jimi Hendrix had gotten away with playing the blues in this new fashion, loud with marshals. I knew, okay, Eddie had that same passion. I knew how to, to make him feel sadder by suggesting play like your mama died. You know, he can tell me, oh man, F you, F you. You know, real quick, but I know it's, he knew what I meant. It stuck with him, so when he started playing it, and it was so good, I had to take the other instruments out. That's why you only hear two guitars. I took the drums out, the bass out, because otherwise it would have been just a, a basic R&B song, blues song. But by taking the rest of them out, it put him on Front Street with all of that feeling. My mother used to call him, oh, crying Eddie again. <laughs> but he cried with every note that he played. And that was intentional, the, the, to make the album that title, because I knew that what Jimmy had done for blues this was going, it's going to take 10 or 15 years for people to get to it. But eventually, to this day, that's the song that most people know Funkadelic by. You know, and so, yeah, one, um, Maggot Brain, that whole album was, yeah. Thank you so much. Number of words. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. congratulations, you so mind you. Yeah. What's happening? What's your name? Hi, my name is Nia, but most people call me Frizzy because my hair is very frizzy. Oh. And <laughs> I'm a fine artist and musician. I actually just graduated from here, and I part of my studies were in Thornton. But um, right now, I'm reading Herbie Hancock's memoir, and he's one of my heroes. And what I love about his book is that he talks about some of his insecurities when he was just getting on the road, being broke, playing with Donald Byrd and Miles Davis, and how he was learning a lot from them and still sort of trying to find his voice as like an early musician. And that was valuable for me because I look at my legends and I always feel like they just popped out the womb like that. And it's nice to know like how they worked up to that status. So I wanted to know if you had any experiences or people who sort of inspired you when you were just getting started and learning how to find your voice and signature. Thank you. People that inspired me, I let, I let pretty much everybody inspire me that I see, see something working for them. I try to find out what it is that they're doing, and I open myself up to even if I don't like it. Yeah. When it, if it's working, there's something I'm missing. So I like I actually open myself up to be inspired, and I got that again. I'm gonna say it again from being around Motown. There was so much talent everywhere you looked. There was talent for somebody like a Stevie Wonder to be. 12 or 13 years old with all those other people around him, he had to become what he, he was already gifted, 
But he had to become that genius that he is today by letting all those people inspire him. And I can, even when somebody go out of style, I still can be inspired by what they did once I know the mechanics of it. So I try to be inspired. Like I say, even if I don't know what it is, I don't like it. If I don't like it, really don't like it, I really want to know what it is. And if it's working, I really need to know what's working there. I go out of my way to find that. I hear that. Thank you so much. Good luck to you as well. How are you? Uh, my name is Brandon. Uh, I'm from Hi, LA. Brandon. I have a two-part question. You got a two-part question, okay. Yeah. Uh, one, I read that uh, Eddie Murphy is going to be playing you in a biopic. Uh, is that true? Yep. Is that the first question? Oh, uh, that's the first question. Okay. And the uh, second and final question is... Good question, by the way, good question. Yeah. And the second question is, of all of your P-Funk catalog, what is your personal favorite album that makes you, every time you listen to it, you're like, that's who we are? <laughs> Bernie Worrell's album, All the Woo in the World. Woo, woo, woo! That's one of my favorite, you know, the band was so perfect. Right. You know, they were so perfect and it was, all the his talent, we were able to do it without any gimmicks. We were able to just, to me, if, I mean, and most of the musicians that's on there, I was talking to Skeet about that just the other day. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. I think we're gonna get everybody in. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, my name is Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Um, hi. I'm also from New Jersey, so always good to know somebody knows what a good bagel tastes like. What part? I'm from South Jersey, so I'm closer to Philly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Woo! South Jersey. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, I just first want to say thank you so much for coming in. As a musician myself, I know there's a lot of musicians in this audience too. It means so much to be hearing from truly a legend, as we've been talking about. My question kind of relates to how you to interpret and listen to music that is coming out now. Uh, I think the way that you phrased it was really amazing, just like, where is the joy? So when you're listening to more modern music that's coming out now, uh, what is it that uh, jumps out as just magical to you? Because so much of it all comes from the Motown label and from so many years before that as well. So I think personally an insecurity in terms of like songwriting and creating music is how can I even get to a fraction of the greatness of all that came before? So. I don't know if that came across clearly, but basically your advice for musicians trying to achieve that same level of joy in that music. For me, the joy is seeing the music go round and around and around and come back to being able to enjoy something like Money Long, doing R&B music in such a fresh way that I can actually appreciate it like it's been the music for the last 20 years. She do that song so good. And it's basic R&B, but unlike anything anybody do. When I see people reviving certain eras in a brand new way, and, and like TikTok, you see a lot of stuff you won't see other places. When I run into something that really makes me feel good, that give me um, hope that I can feel good, that it's still all right. Thank you. This is our last question. Hey, my name is Brian. I'm from DC, Chocolate City. All right, Ryan. Okay. I just, I just mostly, I wanted to thank you for over 60, 50, 60 years of just eye-opening, mind-opening, Stone Cold Grooves, and I, I, I couldn't leave without saying that. And then my question is, well, the other thing is that like your, your social critique, lyrically, your social critique and your comedy has always <coughs> affected me in, 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 in ways that like, you know, you have sonic layers, but I really listen to your lyrics. And I just want to know if, Metamucil has approached you for a pro mental shit back, pro mental shit back wash psychosis enema squad. <laughs> Dad. 
I want to know if Metamucil has approached you for a pro mental shit, but shit backwash psychosis <laughs> in a <my> squad. <laughs> Sample. Listen. We got in trouble for that song when we did, when we did that. Um, I ain't gonna say his name, but it was, um, you know, one of the social, um, how do you say, um, political, um, you know, one of our spokespersons. And they was talking about, you know, like, um, you know, you shouldn't be talking like that. And <laughs> the kids from a school like this said he's talking about being eaten by a sandwich. <laughs> and if you took that serious, something wrong with you. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's fun, and that's why I love it. It's, it's fun. It's a beautiful, it's it's a beautiful love song. Mm -hmm. the, the real deal is I didn't want to... <laughs> I didn't want to put out an album that I thought was perfect. We always had to throw something in there that somebody had to say, why did he do that? <laughs> the, the song is so beautiful as a love song that I just said, let's go in and talk shit on it. <laughs> and that's what we did. We just went all over his beautiful singing. I remember the A&R guy said, Man, why you mess up One Nation album? That's ridiculous. <laughs> but then you know you knew the I put a was clean so version you had on the instrumental too. So Absolutely. You knew the groove was so good that you had the instrumental. You had to play. Oh it no, twice. I put I put it on that clean. I, mm -hmm. I had to. We had to pay for that. You know, remember I had the forty five in there with the album. Mm -hmm. The record company made us pay out of our pocket, but I wanted it on there. I wanted a clean I version, that. just in case you know. Some kids might hear it and their parents didn't want them. They could play the instrumental in the vocal, but it had to have some, some kind of shit on it. Thank you so much. I love you and Thank I Thank you so much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, I, wanna, I just want to thank everybody for their intellectual curiosity, number one, honestly. It's a rainy night in Los Angeles, and y'all are here. I want to thank Mr. George Clinton, George Edwards. And uh, once again, I'm Danielle Smith. Thank you.